Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yudit Erika Magyar, the Eurocess Japan country representative. I would like to welcome all of you um, during your summer holidays. In today's webinar, we are going to have two presenters. Our first presenter today is Paul Harvey, who is a research lead of um, the Autonomous Network Research and Innovation uh, section at Rakuten Mobile Inc. Again, apologies to those of you who would like to listen to Michiko's presentation first. Um, she had a technical glitch, so she's going to go second. Uh, Paul is going to talk about towards a truly autonomous network today. So let me just give you presenter rights, Paul. And uh, again, welcome back, Michiko. Uh, I see you in the system. Uh, she's uh, Michiko Nishijima, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law at Kyushu International University. So our first presenter today is again, Paul. Let me just give you the screen. Here we go. Okie dokie. Uh, hello everybody. Um, good afternoon. Great. So, um, Paul, sorry, yeah. you'll have to um, click on a uh, presenter mode, like a slideshow. Okay. At the moment, can I only see the teeny tiny slides? Uh, okay. Oh, great. Uh, where's the button? Trying to view. Nope. Slideshow. Use presenter view. Either the right. Yeah, that's the one. Success? Thank you so much. Yeah, perfect. There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So just to echo uh, what we were saying there, thank you very much for coming along today. Uh, guys, let's say it's a, well, not technically a holiday, but probably everyone's taking it. So thank you for taking the time to come along. Um, so with a beautiful pink color, uh, we, I guess we shall begin. Um, so my name is Paul Harvey. I am working inside of Rakuten Mobile, and today we're going to talk about how we get towards a truly autonomous network. So what does that mean? Why should you care? Why do we care? And what are we doing about it? So very briefly, uh, I am a computing science researcher. Um, I've been doing research mainly for quite some time now, and I've, I've had a journey that has kind of taken me through all these different steps, and I've had the great fortune to work in many different places, um, working on different interesting problems along the way. And so today, I find myself in Rakuten Mobile, and kind of excitingly, we have uh, a new research lab that we have launched within Rakuten Mobile called the Innovation Studio. Uh, so our task is to have open collaboration with people from different sectors uh, working on relevant problems, whether that's in academia or in industry. And the theme that represents what we're really doing is this notion of autonomous operation of our network. So having the network do many, many different things by itself with uh, minimal human involvement. So I say autonomous, but what do I actually mean by autonomous? So if we break the problem down into kind of three steps, First, we start with manual. This is things that engineers do. So if you consider like a light switch, right? So the ability to turn light on and off is something the engineer has now done. It's created a machine to be able to do it. Going one step further, then we then have automation. So this is where we can tell the system what it is to do. So for example, it's dark, turn on the light, or it's not dark anymore, turn off the light. And the kind of grand culmination of all these different things is this notion of autonomy. So systems that can do these things by themselves and that have learned they can, you know, how to infer knowledge from a situation. So for in the light example, this would be simply the machine knows it's dark, understands what dark means, and is then able to turn on the light to respond to that without having been explicitly told what has to happen. Whereas in the previous case, we were giving very clear rules of it's dark, do something. In this case, the system can do it by itself. Uh, so probably the most common example of autonomy is this idea of the self-driving car or autonomous driving. So in this situation, uh, the car can you know take you from place to place. It can avoid traffic on the roads, and you know effectively do everything that a driver can do. So you can just sit back and relax. The thing is, uh, if you think about it, driving is actually happening in a very constrained place it happens on the road and we have very very good rules as to what should happen uh, on roads speed limits traffic cameras pedestrian crossings etc so we know exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve which of course is a very very difficult problem but the question we ask in terms of autonomy is what happens when the context changes so you're not on the road anymore 
you're now underwater. And so obviously the system wasn't designed to do this. And so it can't respond to it. You know, get out of the car and swim for sure. Hopefully you're going to be okay. And in the end of the day, an engineer has to come back or some creative, some external entity has to come and do something about it. So the question in true autonomy is the idea that the system or whatever it is you have can respond and adapt to unknown and unforeseen contexts and try to do something. Might not always be able to get it correct or right, but it should be able to do something. So autonomy is a really nice thing if you can have it. I mean, we're talking quite some effort here, um, and this is definitely not something that's gonna be achieved in the short term, but why do we care about it? Um, so from our perspective inside the mobile phone network, um, a mobile phone network is everything that is connecting people, whether it's for telephone calls, internet connections or conversations like this, streaming YouTube videos, or you know, having toilets that are now connected and doing things. So the network sits in the middle of all these different things. And as time continues to go by and more and more people use the network and things use the network in different ways, we end up with all these different pressures coming, whether that's you know, 100 billion devices connected by 2025. And it's not just uh, the devices themselves, but it's the ways these devices are using the network. So some are for uh, phone calls, so you have to have very dedicated links. Some are for file downloads that the speed doesn't matter so much so long as it happens. Some are for gaming, which need to be very responsive. So it's many, many devices plus the service that they bring with them. The, the second problem we have is that practically this is really expensive to make it work. And as time is continuing, the, the cost of operating a network or the operational expenditure is increasing, increasing, increasing. And we obviously don't want to you know, just charge all the customers for doing this. So we have to find interesting ways to address this imbalance. And then thirdly, a lot of these things now are happening in software, which means that they're simply beyond the capability of the human to do. In the old days of telephone networks, you would have a switching operator, someone who could like take out a plug and put it in a different place to actually physically connect the calls. As time evolved, that became a machine doing this job and eventually it became software. So that's one example amongst many where software is required to be able to you know, operate the network at the speed and quality that we expect. So of course, if you can have an autonomous network that can do all these things, that's great. <laughs> Solves many problems and probably makes lots of people happy. Um, and you can see the potential opportunities that we get out of this. So what I want to talk to you today now in, in the time that we have left is how we think we can take some steps in this direction of achieving an autonomous network the principles that we're following to try to do this, and ultimately, you know, the research questions we're gonna ask along the way. Um, so we have a bunch of principles and I'm gonna start from here. So let's start here. Specialized approach versus generic approach. So most people in this area, what they're doing is they're taking all of these problems and they're tackling them individually. Um, networks themselves are very, very large, complicated things consisting of many, many parts and many different companies and, and services and products all working together. And in the majority of cases, people are solving problems in different domains, either combined or individual, one by one. But the problem is it takes a lot of time to do this and a lot of effort to do this. And just like, you know, you can't really use a screwdriver or a wrench to cut a piece of string. And so the transferability of these problem uh, solutions that people come up with um, are not so obvious and not necessarily possible in all cases. So from our approach, we take a, a more generic approach to try to say, not so much how to solve each individual problem, but taking one step back and asking the question of how can we have a system that has the potential to solve problems by itself and then can take the next step to actually try to solve them. So that's a bit vague. So let me try and make it a little bit more concrete. So Step one is the idea of building blocks. Okay, so the first principle is the idea that just like Lego or any other you know, popular toy that can be put together has a standard format. And through that standard format, it can be assembled into the same blocks can be assembled into many different types of thing, entity, castles, cars, uh, airplanes, anything your imagination can take you. So this is the first principle. And the nice thing is the, the blocks themselves can be taken, you know, take one out of your airplane, you can put it somewhere else. So that's the first principle. So all functionality can be deconstructed into small atomic modules. The second one is about hybrid intelligence. Now, of course, AI, machine learning and things is very 
popular and very well talked about these days. However, it's from our perspective, it's a, a necessary and important tool that can be used to achieve the, the ultimate goal of autonomy. However, which particular approach it is, or whatever it is, it is not so uh, important to the general case. Again, we see this as a, a building block, a Lego piece, and the right one can be assembled with other blocks to solve particular problems. Okay, so the third thing is this uh, idea of the cognitive loop. So the cognitive loop has many different names in many different fields and has existed for a long time. And its purpose is to have like a, a standard representation of, in this case, cognition, or we call it a, a controller. So it's just like you and me, you have some kind of sensory input. So you can see, or you can hear, or feel, or touch. You have some analysis. So you take all this information and your analysis, oh my God, it's hot. <laughs> or, you know, I'm thirsty or whatever it is. Based on that, you can make a decision, which is to, to rectify my heat, I choose to get some water. And then you have some action stage, which says, I'm gonna literally walk to the fridge to open the door and get some cool drink. And so the, again, the purpose of this is just to have like a, a standard representation that we can start to think about how to solve problems. And in this case, we call it the controller. Uh, so kind of an easy one to imagine is that because you have these Lego blocks that can be put together, um, you can then compose them in many, many different forms and, and ways. So just like the space station can be put together in many different formats, so too can our Lego blocks be assembled within our controllers in many different ways. And the purpose is to allow some exploration, which we're about to talk about. Okay, so secret sauce number one is this idea of online evolution. We can now use these Lego, Lego blocks to assemble things in, in a variety of different ways. And once assembled into a controller, we now introduce two types. First is the operational controller. Its responsibility is to do something. Then the second thing is the evolutionary controller and its responsibility is to assemble these Lego blocks into different formats and configurations. And so nature has shown us that evolution is a very good way to find solutions to problems that are very large and very complicated to understand. So just like Darwin's finches up here. So with everything we've got so far, we now have the ability to try out different potential configurations of blocks to create controllers to address issues or problems. Now, the next question naturally is then, sure, I made one, but is it any good? So then we move to online evolution part two. And here we have the concept that we go through trial and error experimentation. So now that you've created a new controller, you can put it through its paces. Like, does it make sense given whatever it is you're trying to actually do? Um, and so from this perspective, we are also looking at having online systems that look out and try out these systems in different configurations and setups. Going one step further, um, we also apply this kind of evolutionary concept to the evolution controller itself. And in this sense, this is the kind of second secret sauce. And this is what enables us to start exploring the idea of self-adaptation of systems evolving themselves. So just like you can replace a worker, you can also replace a middle manager. You can evolve a new one. And you know this can be arbitrarily deep as you like. Um, and using these two kind of concepts together, we can then start to create hierarchies of these controllers that can be separated into different domains. This guy is taking care of scheduling some traffic within the network. This guy is taking care of, you know, the angles of tilt for our base stations. This guy is taking care of quality of service monitoring or whatever problem you want to explore and look at. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the controller hierarchy. And so my last slide really here is just to say, this is how we can kind of put it all together, the big picture view. So if you take your network, human beings or the domain experts are responsible for taking the relevant knowledge they have in, in the different areas and composing it or you know, packaging it inside these uh, functional blocks. Based on the availability of these Lego blocks, or these functional blocks, the system the, that we're trying to create has the responsibility to assemble them into tools. And then as the situation changes, or if the tools are not very good, the system has the requirement to evolve those tools into others which are more appropriate for the particular task at hand. And of course, as the situation changes, new Lego blocks will come in or old ones will be replaced. But the, the challenge that we have and how we start is to say, how can we frame the problem and a solution that will enable us to achieve autonomy? 
And then as we become more confident in that, we start to target the individual challenges and problems of the tools themselves. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening, uh, short and sweet. Um, so like I say, if you are interested to, to read more, um, we have a link here where we have some, some literature on things that we've been talking about. And of course, this is my email address. Um, just to repeat, we are interested in you know working with other people and seeing what's going on out there and, and finding good solutions. This is research, and we're trying to very much keep the spirit of research alive in the Braxton Mobile Innovation Studio. So thank you very much. And I guess I'll hand back to the chair at this point. Thank you very much, Paul. I truly enjoyed the presentation and uh, also the, the pictures to go with it. It was much more, um, it was much easier to actually understand it. Uh, I would like to encourage the audience to submit any questions that they may have. You see the questions panel. Please type your questions in there and uh, I shall read them to Paul. Again, any questions that you may have? Alternatively, you can um, simply send Paul an email afterwards or send us an email at japan at euroxcess.net. Any of you who are interested in autonomous networks, you may have a question. Maybe um, just from that point, just to say something, it was, uh... One of the interesting things we think about the system that we're trying to create is we think it has applicability beyond networking. Um, so if maybe my question to the, the group of people here, in case anybody has any thoughts, would be, do you see, well, firstly, does it make sense? Assuming it did. Um, do you see how perhaps this could be applied in, in your space? Uh, so to take our other presenter, Nishijima-san, how, how would such a system exist in a legal framework? Um, I know there's a lot of efforts applying AI techniques to do automatic reasoning in the legal field. Um, but how about, you know, would it make sense to try and explore the concept of a system which could adapt to different legal strategies or arguments? I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of spitballing. But yeah, any, any cross fertilization is well received. Okay, I um, do not see any questions from the audience at this point. So I'm guessing some uh, questions might be addressed to you at a later stage. Thank you very much again, Paul. And uh, I would 